Welcome to the next uh, CPPC. Do you hear? Me? Yeah, CPPC uh, seminar. And today we have in unusual format, in a hybrid format, um, because uh, we are very happy that Albert Joe is visiting us again. He's back to his alma mater. Albert was, uh, did his undergrad in Sydney with us and uh, very successfully he graduated with a university medal and uh, his honors thesis was recognized as the best honors thesis in 2021 or something like that, right? By the Australian Institute of Physics. And um, since then he moved to Germany, Karlsruhe and he did his PhD there, completed his PhD there. Um, uh, and he's now an expert in neutrino uh, phenomenology and theory, uh, and he will be talking about neutrino oscillations and new physics. Okay, over to you, Albert. Okay, thanks, Archul, for that introduction. Just in case you didn't catch it, I also had an introduction slide. So Archul is also my honors supervisor as well. So he should, yeah, <laughs> exactly. He should take some credit. So that was on scale invariance and early cosmology. And so then I went and did my PhD in Karlsruhe in Germany. And I was funded by this uh, German academic exchange service. And so my topic in my PhD was looking at neutrino oscillation experiments and seeing how you can investigate new physics in the neutrino sector. So during my time there, I was involved in these three projects. Uh, so I won't actually talk about the global analysis of neutrino data uh, for time reasons, although there, I have some backup slides you can ask about that. Uh, so I'll mostly talking, be talking about looking at um, the fourth evidence for a fourth oscillating sterile neutrino and looking at the neutrino dipole portal at two. So before I get into the talk, in case you're wondering, where is this city called Karlsruhe? It's a small city if you're in Germany or a large town, if you're not in Germany, uh, between, uh, let's say Stuttgart, Heidelberg and Strasbourg near the border with France. And so this is my group. I recently graduated on the 1st of July. And uh, so recently graduated this is my supervisor, Thomas. And uh, you know, in Germany, there's no official ceremony. So instead, you, you just gather with your colleagues and you they order at least at KIT a big pretzel, like a ginormous pretzel. That's, yeah, it's, <laughs> I don't have a picture of that, but they also make you this PhD hat with thematic items on it. So you can see like there's a neutrino here. So instead of your, an official ceremony, you have your colleagues make a PhD hat. Okay, yeah. So I want to start with like a historical introduction. So as you probably know, in 1930, Pauli suggested that uh, there's an extra neutral particle emitted in beta decay because instead of just uh, observing a line for the electron energy, we observe this continuous spectrum. But he actually thought this new particle was contained in the nucleus and had like the mass of an electron. So it was actually Fermi in 1934 who came up with what we now understand to be the neutrino, which is the particle that's created in the decay process. So here's the quote from his article, which is in German because he submitted his article to a German journal. And he basically says, just like you can create and destroy electrons, you can do the same with neutrinos. And if you associate a neutrino and an electron with a process that changes a neutron to a proton, then you can conserve charge. And so he basically takes the QED coupling and replaces the electron current with a proton neutron current and the four potential with an electron neutrino current, which might seem very trivial to us today. But you have to remember at this time, QED had just been invented. So for example, he has to explain which combinations of fermionic bilinears transforms as a four vector. Now it's like, uh, duh, we know what it is. But for him, it was like, oh, I had to write down all the combinations and then I chose the correct one, which transforms like a potential. So he didn't even, I don't think he, I can't remember if he used the word four vector, but his analogy is like, this is like the electromagnetic potential. But now it's just a current and it's like obvious for us. And so then in 1953, 
The first antineutrino was observed using the delayed scintillation signal to reduce background. And this is the same signal that we use in reactor experiments today, where you have a reactor antineutrino coming in and it emits a positron, which annihilates very quickly. And that's your prompt signal. And then it emits and it kicks out a neutron, which kind of scatters a bit and is absorbed on a doped uh, nucleus, in this case, cadmium in the original experiment. And then that releases a bunch of gamma rays. So, and these, those two processes have different time scales, and you can see these two flashes to reduce, you know, cosmic ray backgrounds and stuff. So then in 1963, people were investigating whether you can observe the neutrinos from the sun. And uh, a lot of advancements had to be made in uh, nuclear processes, the cross-section of nuclear processes, because you can see there are many processes that happen in the sun. And then also uh, Barcall found that um, the cross-section of absorption on a chlorine atom uh, is enhanced due to uh, transitions to excited states of argon. And so the idea was that you want to take these high energy neutrinos, and even though there are not so many of them, they have a very high cross-section. And so this is what the home state experiment did, which is famous now using half a kiloton of chlorine, just, you know, underground, you wait there and you extract the chlorine, the argon and the chlorine every month or so and look at the decays. And uh, eventually it was established that there was a one third deficit. So uh, this was uh, rather controversial at the time because as you can see, there were many nuclear processes. What if something goes wrong? And the thing is the first, uh, in 1969, that's just one year after, the first proposal, the two flavor oscillations, but you can't explain a one third deficit. So you need three flavors of neutrinos with maximal mixing and people found that very unnatural. So there were many other uh, proposals like a neutrino magnetic moment, which is kind of like the precursor to the dipole portal. But eventually in 1986, people found out that the neutrino oscillations are modified in matter and you will have resonance effects. And this turns out to be the correct solution, which was conclusively uh, shown by SNO, which measured all of the neutrinos using a neutral current interaction. So what was this proposal black hole? Yeah, there is some crazy. Someone said maybe there's a black hole in the middle of the sun. I don't know. I can't remember. This is this is. Yeah. So you can find all of these and references of all of these uh, proposals in Bacall's book, Neutrino Astrophysics, in 1979 or 19. No, it must be late. I can't remember. Anyway, yeah, yeah. There was there were more. There was also a WIMP proposal. And also, if uh, if the neutrinos have the same mass but feel gravity differently, then you could also explain this. Yeah, but that, that's that's the old model that was made. Yeah, yeah. So is it a third or is it? It's a third. It depends. So it depends. So the high, the it depends on the high and low energy. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, so the resonance only occurs for the high energy neutrinos. So if you go to the low energy neutrinos, then it's only a half. There's no resonance. So they, they observed the third. Right, because they were looking at the high energy neutrinos because they have a high cross section. Um, um, oh, yeah, he was asking whether the deficit was a third or a half. So it's a half for the low energy neutrinos, but they didn't observe that because the high energy neutrinos have the larger cross section. Those are the ones they were looking at. Yeah, so there were, there were exhalations this, if you always have the resonance or you only sometimes have the resonance and it turns out you only sometimes have the resonance. Okay, so for people who don't know anything about neutrino oscillations, basically we have uh, the neutrinos created in the weak processes, the fl so-called flavor states are actually combinations of the massed eigenstates, these nu one, two, three, which have a definite mass and as they propagate, each mass eigenstate, which has a has different energies to slightly different energies to the mass, and they propagate coherently as a superposition. And if you just use quantum mechanics, you can get a transition probability with a sinusoidal soidal dependence with the uh, with the propagation distance with the frequency set by this mass squared splitting. 
And as I said, in matter, you will have forward scattering on electrons, and this will change the energy of your electron neutrino. Now, uh, we have observed uh, oscillations with these two different frequencies. This is the solar, so-called solar frequency, and this is the atmospheric frequency. Uh, so I'm not talking about the global fit, but I'll just mention that if you just look at the survival probability, what happens is, is the imaginary proponent of this thing is zero, it's purely real, and so this term disappears, and you get a sign degeneracy for the mass squared differences. Now, we actually know the sign of this solar uh, frequency because of the resonance, but we don't know the sign of the other one. And so we have these two possibilities. We have the lighter, sorry, the pair with a small mass difference either being a lighter pair or the heavier pair. So normal or inverted ordering. Maybe uh, repeat why one is called. So the solar one is called the solar because the other one is not the sun. Yeah, so the atmospheric one is just, it was discovered by observing atmospheric neutrinos. That's it, yeah. So there was a similar atmospheric anomaly, an atmospheric deficit. And then they went through this whole process again. Uh, so originally it was observed by these kind of kooky small experiments with like a, just like a, a, lots of emulsion plates in like a mine. And then Super K was the one which kind of uh, conclusively yeah, observed this. The atmosphere, or... yeah, so the neutrinos come from the atmosphere, yeah. So the question was why they called why it's called the atmospheric uh, sector, and it's just because that it was observed from atmospheric neutrinos. So some more subtleties I want to mention. So these neutrino oscillations require coherency, and this requires some energy momentum uncertainty, because if you could perfectly tell the energy momentum of each neutrino, you they couldn't oscillate. Or in an extreme case, if there was a heavy neutral particle which mixed with the neutrinos with a mass GeV, that particle would not be created in a nuclear decay because of energy momentum conservation. And if you had a MeV or KeV neutrino, probably you can tell the difference by observing the charged lepton. Another uh, subtlety is that uh, I talked about weak flavor states, but uh, these states don't really exist in quantum field theory because uh, norm normally when you do perturbation theory, you solve the free field equations and the free field equations have to have a definite mass in the propagator. You can't have uh, a, a, a current sum over Feynman propagators. Uh, so this is, is this, you can read more about this in this paper by Gionti. And so in quantum field theory, what happens is that, let's say you have an accelerator with, you have a pion from proton onto target and this decays and, decays into a muon and you know it's a muon because of the mass and then it emits some neutrinos of each mass state and then you see a positron in the detector and then you sum over this you sum over the amplitudes not over the amplitude squared that's the coherency and then the energy momentum uncertainty comes from your external particles having some wave pack instead of being a plane wave but uh uh, that's, uh, that doesn't really matter for us because, well, uh, it could matter, but uh, that's not being explored so much and its effects are kind of subleading. So now, as I said, I want to talk about new physics. And uh, so there, as you probably know, we need new physics to generate the neutrino mass. So many models will introduce heavy neutral leptons, uh, but there, there is no a priori reason for all of them to be heavy. and there, so there have been searches for uh, light new singlet fermions of a mass order EV, which say mixes with the electron neutrino. So then we will have, uh, our mixing matrix will be a four by four matrix. So we've introduced a new mass state. And so in the flavor basis, we will get a new sterile neutrino, which has, which you assign a charge of zero for all of the gauge groups and stuff. And then we will also have a new mass squared splitting, which will have new oscillations. And this mass squared splitting is much bigger than all the standard model splitting. So uh, when you search for this, you will just use the two flavor effective probability. So you only have to worry about a new mixing and a new mass squared splitting. And in the, so in the standard model ex uh, oscillation experiments, these oscillations will average out 
because if the phase is very big, if the frequency is very big and you average over the energy, then this will just become a constant. So uh, some of, there, are, there, are this, there is this LSND and mini burn excess, which looked for electron neutrinos in a muon neutrino beam. And they found an excess of electron-like events. Now, this is probably not new oscillations, and I'll talk more about what it could be if it's the neutrino dipole photo and why you're interested in that. So there are these, but that was so that was for muon neutrinos. That now there are other anomalies with for electron neutrinos. So one of them is called the gallium anomaly, where this is part of a calibration of solar neutrino experiments, where you take a chromium source and uh, measure the neutrinos from that in a liquid gallium detector. And there you see a deficit. You also see a deficit between your prediction and your observation for reactors, but there are many um, spectral features in the reactor flux that are unknown. So people are wondering, maybe this, the reactor anomaly is just, you know, we don't understand the reactor flux, and so this is why people started these flux researches where you look at the spectrum at the near detector and a far detector and look for spectral distortions. That would be uh, incontrovertible evidence of oscillations. And so that's uh, what we were looking at. Um, so these experiments ask the question if the electron neutrino mixes with a fourth EVCR mass state, where this is the electron neutrino in the three neutrino parameterization. So I said we used the two flavor probability. Now, one of these flux-free experiments, neutrino four, sees around three sigma evidence for new oscillations. Um, however, if you really want to tell, you know, if this is strong evidence, you should really look at all the other experiments and what they say. So you need to do a global analysis. Now, there's also a constraint on the mixing from solar data, which we include. And after we start the process, the a collaboration called BEST confirm the gallium anomaly at more than five sigma. So that was a kind of twist. So briefly on how you do this. So we construct kind of simplified simulations of the experiments. So you take your flux and cross section that's in the literature. You smear the uh, survival probability over the baseline distribution because the baselines are small enough that you have to take into account the finite size of the source and the detector. And then there are all these detector effects in the reconstruction matrix. For example, if your detector is very small, one of those annihilation photons could escape. And this is uh, all in the reconstruction matrix. Then you construct a flux free test statistic. So you have some systematic you minimize over some arbitrary normalization and some other systematics like the energy scale, you might shift the bin widths and you have this whole term. And then you get your chi squared as a function of your parameters, the mixing and the mass squared splitting. And then you construct this test statistic, delta chi squared, which is your chi squared at some parameter point minus the minimum over all of the parameter space. Uh, but there's a complication, which is that normally you can assume that this delta chi squared has a chi squared distribution according to Wilkes theorem, but Wilkes theorem is violated in this case. So we have to calculate the distribution of this thing numerically by first um, creating fake data. So you basically take your prediction at some hypothesis point in parameter space, take that as an average, inject statistical fluctuations on top, and for each fluctuated data set, calculate the minimum and then the chi squared of your hypothesis point minus the minimum to get one delta chi squared value and then do that many to many times. And then you can calculate what the real distribution is. So here's, for example, at the null hypothesis, if there are no um, new oscillations, this is what the delta chi squared distribution is, and red is what Wilkes theorem would tell you, so it's very different. So, I will get into that in the next slide. So uh, this is very computationally expensive, and I had to, yeah, anyway, I won't go into those details. So which, why is Wilkes theorem violated? So firstly, uh, for example, sorry, it basically tells you the distribution of delta chi squared, so it's this red line here. It says that the delta chi squared should be distributed like this red line. So uh, why is it violated? So uh, if, for example, uh, your profile of your chi delta chi squared uh, 
in the mixing should normally just be a parabola. But if the minimum of the parabola is outside this range, there's no interpretation for the mixing. So if you want to be physical, you should take the minimum to be zero, even though it should be maybe at minus 0 0.1. Now, and that, that will affect Wilkes theorem. The second thing is that there are many local minima. So Wilkes theorem is only a local thing. It can, it, can, it can work if you have one minimum here, but if you have many and one fluctuation, this thing goes down and this thing goes up, Wilkes theorem can't tell you about that, the, the relative weights for these different minima. And then also there's a problem at, when the mixing is zero, your delta m squared parameter becomes unphysical. And so then actually, for example, Wilkes theorem at, for, for sine squared two theta equals zero should just be with one degree of freedom. And then there should be a con continuous change, which you know, it's not, you know, that's not, uh, that can't be captured. So here's the results for each experiment. In the thin lines is uh, what Wilkes theorem says. And for the bands, this is sort of cousins, where the band is uh, a 99% confidence spread because of a finite um, Monte Carlo size. Basically, uh, if you have a p-value, right, then the number of times you observe a delta chi squared bigger than some critical value is distributed as a binomial distribution. And this is how you calculate this band. But basically here, you can see the one sigma band is like here over the two sigma Wilkes. And here for neutrino four, the two sigma band kind of matches the three sigma world. So you see roughly a one sigma reduction. And uh, in the if you do the global fit, then this best fit for, best fit point for the reactors under Wilkes would have a two point two sigma significance, but actually uh, it's only one point one sigma. And uh, if you include the solar constraint, then the solar constraint kills many of these islands, and your best fit point actually moves to this. A small mixing and low delta m squared. But if you in, if you instead combine with gallium, gallium prefers very large mixing, but doesn't know what the delta m squared is, and that's set by neutrino four. And the significance is also set by gallium. You can see some enormous significance there. However, we cannot cannot combine solar and gallium data together because there is a large tension. So you can quantify this using the parametric goodness of fit test, which says it's more than three sigma. But basically this is the solar constraint and the larger mixings are excluded. So basically all of the relevant gallium parameter space. And here's the catrin, which becomes relevant a very high delta n squared. This is another experiment uh, measuring the neutrino mass. And it can also look for sterile neutrinos. So you can ask, can you, uh, this is not polished, but it's in my thesis because it didn't work. You can ask, can you re relax the solar constraint? So for example, if the new heavy, heavier neutrino decays into standard model neutrinos, maybe you can relax the constraint. But it turns out that, um, that the decay, standard model decay products lose energy. And in order to reduce backgrounds, all of the solar neutrino experiments have a relatively large energy threshold. So it turns out like a quarter of like the decaying neutrinos uh, are below the energy threshold, so you won't observe them anyway. So uh, basically, and you can only reduce the tension by like half a sigma. So it's not, it can't really explain it. So you can also uh, wonder if there are hidden systematics in the gallium experiment. So the gallium absorption cross section uh, is bounded below by measurements of it, the contribution from the ground state. So it's probably, it's, you can't really explain a deficit using the absorption cross section. Now the flux prediction uh, depends on the measurement of the heat output from the chromium source. And then you divide this by the heat uh, generated per decay. And uh, the decay scheme for chromium is very simple, which is why they use it. So it's basically chromium decays into the ground state of vanadium or the excited state. Uh, with a branching ratio to the excited state of 10%. And the excited state of vanadium will decay to the ground state via a 320 keV gamma ray. And this is the majority of heat produced per decay. Uh, however, this is the uh, subleading decay branch. And uh, this is determined by nuclear chemists, experimentalists who claim there's a sub percent precision on this uh, quantity. Uh, however, looking at this thing, um, you know, if you could shift this branching ratio up to 11 or 12%, if it's 12%, the, the, uh, 
the anomaly would disappear. And if it's 11%, you could alleviate it, the tension with solar. So uh, one of my climaters, uh, Patrick Huber says, okay, they use germanium crystals, which maybe, maybe there's some hidden systematic there. They also have a very low efficiency of 10 to the minus three. So let's say that you calibrate your efficiency using calibrated sources of gamma rays. Now, if there's a unknown background component, right? If there, if there are, you know, gamma rays produced from some scattering from some external thing, then you would overestimate your efficiency and then underestimate your branching ratio. Okay, but I'm not a nuclear chemist, but uh, if I were to guess why is there a tension, my guess would be that their quoted uncertainties are too small. But uh, I, this is just total supposition. So can you just elaborate on what exactly this gallium experiment is observing the space for its DNA? No tension. No, no. So this is just, so this was originally just calibrating the gallium experiment. So you just take uh, a source of neutrinos that you can calibrate really, really well. And you compare with how many neutrinos you observe and you get a deficit, right? So what I'm saying here is maybe that your flux prediction is wrong because your heat per decay is wrong because you've got the branching ratio a little bit wrong. So yeah, so there's no tension so there's only tension between the gallium deficit and the fact that you don't observe a deficit from in your solar models. So, and the question was that uh, why there, uh, there is no tension in the solar data. So I was just clarifying the difference between the gallium anomaly and, and the solar data, which is all good and the models. Okay, so now moving on to the neutrino dipole portal. So there we're looking at this effective operator which is you have a standard model neutrino or flavor alpha coupled to a heavy neutrino or neutral lepton via a kind of magnetic interaction. And I will only consider one flavor coupling per time, flavor transition coupling. So why are you interested in this? This is because this is an alternative explanation for the mini boot excess. Now this was actually pro proposed by Ganenko in 2009, where he said, now, if you have a new heavy neutral lepton that mixes with the muon neutrino that is produced by some scat neutral current scattering, then this heavy neutrino could travel to your mini boon detector and decay using a single photon. Now, the mini boon detector is a, a mineral oil Cherenkov detector, which means that it just uses the light from an electron, an electromagnetic shower from an electron in the detector, but a, gamma, a high energy gamma ray can mimic this signal and they can't tell the difference. Uh, between those two. So this is the decay width, and we're now looking at about masses of 10 to 100 MeV. So I, my project was uh, looking for looking at for this dipole signal at Dune, but uh, maybe a bit of background on mini boon. So as I said before, they had a muon neutrino beam and looking at if, they're, if they're, there's electron neutrinos at a very short baseline, so a new oscillation frequency. So they observed this excess, by the way, this red background misidentified pi zeros. This is from a pi zero that decays into two gammas with a very small angle such that it only looks like one gamma or one electromagnetic shadow. Now, this is probably not oscillations because uh, if, you, if the muon neutrinos were oscillating to electron neutrinos, then you should see a deficit of muon neutrinos. And not all the muon neutrino experiments, you don't see a deficit. So this is the constraint for the muon mixing to a fourth neutrino set by say Minos or Ice Cube. And this is the relevant parameter space for the excess. And they all, Mini Burn also did uh, a background study where they uh, uh, tried to fit the radial distribution of the excess with arbitrary normalizations of different backgrounds. And so you can see here, they found that the best fit was with oscillations, but they also found the second best fit was single photon emission from a delta resonance created by neutral current scattering. Now, the standard model delta resonance single photon process has already been constrained by micro boon, which is kind of like a check of, check of mini boon. So that so so maybe it could be uh, the neutrino dipole portal. So in 2018. These authors did the first kind of systematic in the dipole portal 
uh, where the production happens by a, a photon scattering as well, instead of the heavy neutral current scatter. They found uh, they have all these exclusions um, based on accelerated data and the supernova burst. And they also have projections, projected exclusions from a proposed uh, experiment called SHIP. Now the purple uh, collider bounds actually depend on the electroweak UV completion because uh, in an electroweak UV theory, if, if something couples to the photon, it should couple to the B fields and the other fields, and therefore it should have a coupling with the W and Z. But you need, yeah, so, but you can't predict that with a low energy model. So there's a problem, we, uh, in terms of the model building, there's a problem which is that any dipole diagram can produce a correction to the neutrino mass. So if you were to just remove this dipole here, you would get this correction to the neutrino mass. Of course, in the standard model, this is multiplicatively renormalizable, right? But then this introduces a kind of relation between the dipole and neutrino mass. So actually, there was some theoretical work because there was a now non-existent hint of a solar modulation of this annual modulation of the solar flux. And Voloshin identified a mechanism where because the uh, mass term of the neutrino and the dipole term have a different um, charge under this horizontal symmetry, um, basically one is symmetric, the other anti-symmetric, uh, this is a way to suppress uh, the dipole term relative to the mass term. You can also put this in like the Z mass model. But anyway, I'm not going to talk about like model building. So, okay, Dune. So Dune is a, uh, has a 70, their far detector is a 70 kiloton detector of cryogenic liquid argon. That's, that's a hell of a lot of liquid argon, by the way. And uh, the reason why you use this, so this is micro burn I mentioned earlier, which is currently operating, is that you have really good resolution. So you can identify all the particles really well. Just for comparison, this is Nova, which is also run by Fermilab. So here you see the, these pixel sizes like 10 centimeters. And here you can see, for example, the pi naught. So you can see if these pi naughts were like really close together, you'd think that's maybe, maybe only one. These two gamma, sorry. Um, but yeah, so my, June should have really good background, dis, uh, sorry, particle discrimination. Maybe stupid question, maybe you shouldn't. If you can get 70 kilotons of liquid argon, why are you not using that at the dark end? Because it would be much more Uh, so his question was, why don't we use uh, 70 kilotons of liquid argon for the dark matter detectors instead of using one six tons of liquid xenon? Yeah, so the energies are much higher. That's what Kieran said. Yeah, and the background has to be very low. Yeah, they also had this problem with boroxino. This is why the energy threshold is too high because the recall energies are much lower. Like, here we're talking about in, like GV processes. There they're talking about like KV processes. That's really hard. And you have to purify the xenon, like this xenon anomaly, which now no longer exists, could have been helium, it could have been some random isotope. Boroxino also had this problem. So um, yeah, so the original idea of the uh, of this project was that it's very difficult to constrain tau neutrino properties because it's difficult to produce an intense flux of them. But uh, a dune, which is meant to measure delta CP uh, parameter, uh, this is their far detector is placed at the oscillation maximum. So you have a bunch of tau neutrinos near the far detector and you can use them to study the d tau flavor transition um, coupling. And so here, for example, you have um, near the far detector, this upscattering tau neutrino to this heavier neutrino, which travels to the far detector and gives you a single photon signal. And then later, we also realized that we can just use the intrinsic flux of uh, electron and muon neutrinos at the near detector to constrain DE and D nu. So now the, the, I kind of classify these different signal types. So the first are kind of what I call outside events which is uh, when the upscattering occurs outside the earth and the signature is just a single photon event in the detector. 
And so in the calculation, basically, because the baseline of June is like 1,300 kilometers and the detector size is like tens of meters, I ignore in this calculation all detector geometry. And there's a kind of like approximate cylindrical symmetry, symmetry around the beam axis, which is only broken by the boundary conditions of the earth because you can only upscatter in the earth. And then the other type of events are inside events, so which can also produce uh, different uh, kind of signatures for detection. So you, I, you can also have different types of scattering. One of them is coherent neutrino scattering, where the neutrino uh, scatters on the whole nucleus and you have this coherent uh, enhancement. Uh, now, it, may, it will be difficult to observe the nuclear recoil of low energy, although it may be possible in liquid argon. Um, but you'll definitely see the single photon signature. Now you can also have incoherent scattering on an individual nucleon where you see a, uh, an event similar to like a neutral current event and then a displaced single photon event. And this was being called uh, a double bang event or double bang topology by other authors much earlier. And so here, everything, all the action happens inside the detector. And so I assume the detector is far away. So the flux is collimated and also homogeneous, although um, this is not quite correct for the near detector, but anyway. And then there are some uh, geometric factors that I consider. So there's an approximate cylindrical symmetry, which is broken when rho is not zero, and you can account for that. But anyway, here is uh, the six event per year curves for the different uh, event types. So for the outside events in dotted line, you can see coherent uh, events always dominate, but they end at a large mass and large dipole couplings because as you go to larger masses and dipole couplings, your decay length decreases, which means that the available space around the detector that the heavy neutrinos can be created in order to reach the detector in order to decay is growing smaller and smaller and smaller. And, and it has a maximum roughly of about uh, two divided by the decay length. And here you can see that uh, the this sensitivity roughly cuts off when your uh, decay length is roughly 20 meters. So that's roughly the size of the detector. And in any way, my approximations of ignoring detector geometry will be violated here anyway. So the inside events you can see has a uh, sensitive to larger masses and coherent scattering dominates until because uh, you don't have enough energy to create the heavy neutrino, you get this, uh, the signal dies off and also the incoherent scattering uh, becomes more dominant. And this gray line, this is when the decay length is a centimeter. So above this, the higher uh, dipole couplings and masses, you won't be able to see this double bang signature because then your decay length is smaller than your detector resolution. And so here is a comparison with SHIP. So in their analysis, they assume 100 background events over five years. So whenever, you think, whenever phenomenologists do these uh, projected sensitivities, they're always making assumptions about the background, which, um, you know, yeah, well, who knows? Who knows if it's correct? So I only show events per year, which corresponds to roughly 20 to 2,000 events based on this two is 20 events at 95% or 20 events will be 2,000. Um, but, you know, I am not an experimentalist, so I have no idea what the background should be. Because it's liquid argon, hopefully it's really good. But, uh, yeah. And so here's the global space. So here the shaded is uh, what's currently excluded. And dotted lines are only approximations or projections by, so projections or op approximations by phenomenologists. Whereas in the red shaded is the band of like, you know, two to 20 event per year. And then the uh, larger couplings are excluded. So basically, globally, we should be able to exclude unexcluded parts of parameter space. Here's for muons and here's for electrons. So you can see muons, there are many more experiments because people like, it's easy to make muon neutrinos. Yeah, two. Yeah. So if you go back to the do you know which of the browser space, if any, would let this uh, heavy neutrino be? Yeah, yeah. So it's roughly, I mean, this is in the McGill paper. It's some, some roughly around here. Uh, you, this is this is in the 2018 paper, but yeah. So it's basically roughly at the edge of the sensitivity of the mini boom. Oh. 
So, because to make this exclusion curve for mini boom, they have to make some assumptions that, you know, there's no excess, and then they have to make assumptions on the background, you know, there, there is some background assumptions. What's that again? Uh, um, I thought I believe that the only constraint of band. No, no, no. Sorry, no. So yeah. So no, the band. Okay. So the first question was, uh, where was me? Where was the solution to explain excess for minibin relevant? So it's as near the sensitivity. So no. So the band is just the band of two to twenty event per year. So it's the band is just this band here, right? But everything above here is excluded. It's just it's to, to say I don't know where. The sensitivity curve is because I don't know what the background is. But at ninety-five percent, your exclusion curve or sensitivity curve should be in the band. But everything above the band is excluded. Yeah. yeah. No, no, no. Otherwise, it would not be very interesting. <laughs> it was just that band. So some updates. So um, oh, I spelled his name wrong. There should be a G. Arguelles. He was. In, I think he was involved. In, he was involved. He's at Fermilab. Anyway. Basically, there was some people who did the dipole portal study at Minerva using existing data. That was this year. And they have some constraints. But I think June will still be slightly better. So uh, we ignored uh, uh, the production of heavy neutral leptons from meson decay. So if you have a new interaction, then you have new meson decay channels, and this can directly produce heavy neutral leptons. Now, my supervisor had a new PhD student who like does like serious simulations and everything. And so this is this contribution is subleading. But now he is looking at probing larger masses because uh, I could only use some of the uh, fluxes uh, from the collaboration, which cut off at like 5 GeV. But there are there's a flux of higher energy neutrinos, which may be able to probe higher mass, higher masses. So uh, now just concluding, I hope you have shown you that neutrinos are interesting to study. So first I went, had a historical overview of neutrinos and I introduced neutrino oscillations and some of their subtleties. And then I was talking about sterile oscillations in the reactor spectral data. And so the gallium data uh, really wants there to be a sterile neutrino, but there's this tension with solar, which is unexplained. And finally, June will be able to probe the neutrino dipole portal quite well. And hopefully, hopefully they see a signal. Okay, so thanks for the attention. And are there any other questions from Zoom maybe as well? They will have to unmute. Yeah, if you have a question, put your hand up before you ask it. You may not be able to hear. Or maybe, maybe they're all making coffee right now. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know if that television is set to actually output themselves, given that. Ah. Oh. Well, what is in the chat? No, no, that was Kevin, I think. He was saying. <laughs> oh, it, it is those. <laughs> I was just saying that I can hear yeah, okay. so the, uh, uh, the others in the room. Um, so the projection, the projection part. This? Yeah. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll put the second one. Yeah. Uh, all right. So sh I guess, yeah, I guess my, my question is <laughs> June, you're assuming a 70 kilograms, right? Yeah. Potentially quite a way of Well, uh, I mean, it's. Oh yeah, he was. So the question is, when when June will be operational? Is it kind yeah, of at this, size. at this size? Well, I mean, so uh, okay, so so this thing, okay, so for the muon um, uh, channel, you only need the near detector. So the near detector, I can't remember how much. So, the, so it turns out the near detector is a bit more complicated. So here we just assume some certain kilotons of liquid argon, but it turns out that they have this thing called. Um, what is it called? Now I can't remember the acronym, but basically in order to reduce uh, flux systematics, they have a liquid argon detector and a gaseous argon detector, which captures low energy charge particles. And this thing can move on off axis as well. So this thing will not stay on on axis, it will go off axis to, to basically look at the flux systematics of different types of fluxes. And I haven't included that in, you know, in this calculation, but there will be, 
a electric electromagnetic calorimeter, which is specifically designed to observe photons from pion decay. And but I don't know how well this can constrain the dipole portal. But uh, so but that's uh, that's being built in terms of the far detector, right? So okay, so this is the story. So originally, so seventy kilotons is the total mass. They have a fiducial mass of forty kilotons, which I already. I mean, that's already taken into account. But originally the plan was to have a 10 kiloton fiducial far detector. And then what happened is that T2K um, published a white paper saying that they will have better sensitivity than Dune. And so then Dune simply multiplied that, their fiducial mass by four to get the same sensitivity because there's this competition for like who will observe CP violation the first. But uh, uh, so because the thing is, right, so maybe you're wondering because ship is ship is going to be really expensive, like a billion dollars, because it's going to be above ground. So in order to reduce for the background, you need all these crazy like electronic systems on the roof. Uh, but the thing is, is that Dune is like a flagship program of Fermilab because there's like this big thing about CP violation. And so the politics there's a very strong political reason that Dune will be built at 40 kiloton fiducial mass. And it's currently being built. And it's like, there's a lot of, I think Fermilab has put, you know, like, like the James Webb telescope. This is like the, I think this is the James Webb telescope for the neutrino program of Fermilab. Why is ship being built above ground? So the question is why is ship being built above ground? And the answer is, I have no idea. Uh, I think this is no, maybe it's, there's no space underground. It's because, so ship is at the beam dump of the CERN, super proton synchrotron SPS beam dump. And maybe it's just the geometry. I can't remember, I, I don't know why, but for some reason their plan is to build it above, them, which is why it's so expensive. Um, so there are also those field experiments that turn on the FED of LSD in space to move, which also basically will look from the uh, from the Couldn't they also put constraint on the side portal? Uh, yes, yeah, so, th yeah, so the, the question is, is uh, can um, neutrino beam dump experiments at the LHC, like phase and U, um, constrain the dipole portal? The, the answer is, I think, yes. I mean, when I, when I, I presented a poster at WIN and I was talking to someone doing exactly this, I can't remember if they published a paper already. I can't remember. I think in principle, yes. And people in phase and U are working on that. Yeah, there's a Polish guy uh, at Stanford, I think, who's he's, he's in the phase and U collaboration doing this kind of stuff, yeah. Where do we get all this argon? So the question is, where do we get all this argon from? So I think the answer is the air. You, that's why they use argon. So basically the reason why they chose argon is it's the heaviest noble gas that you can extract from the air. Yeah. And, you know, they don't care about, I guess they don't care about nuclear decays, whereas xenon you have to... Yeah. I, yeah, maybe it's cheaper to do liquid argon. Yeah, because you know you need seventy kilotons. I guess so. Xenon, it's harder. Yeah, yeah. That's why you don't use seventy kilotons of argon, because you don't worry. You don't worry about isotopes in these in these neutrino experiments. Oh, but that's, that's, that's the theory. Um, okay. Theory. Yeah. Um, you mean for the mini burn excess? Yeah. There are, I, so I haven't personally looked at other explanations, but there are many other explanations with like new scalar fields and stuff like this. Basically anything that can produce a single electromagnetic shower would mimic mini burn. Since you're on that slide, yeah, the bottom you mentioned that kind of the correction to the neutrino mass. Couldn't you just tune it? Yeah, so Michael asks, what's, what's wrong with tuning the neutrino mass? So I mean, so the thing, so if, you, for example, if you have a scalar in the loop here instead of a W boson, uh, you get a quadratic divergence like the Higgs mass correction. And then the also they say, yeah, but the Higgs mass is, you know, has this divergence that we don't care about. We don't care about predicting neutrino mass. Yeah, I mean, why not? I don't know. People don't like it though. People don't like fine tuning. Uh, you well, know, why is 
just if you remove if you remove the photon line and you just have scalars in the loop. Uh, oh no, maybe. I think you still have a lepton here, but if you have a scalar here, no photon here, I think it will be. Uh, I think it'll have the same divergence like Higgs, no? Um, maybe logarithm. Okay, maybe it's. Yeah, I mean, yeah, for sure, but uh, uh, yeah, I mean, I mean, the question is, why would uh, I mean, the question is, why is there um, why would the dipole? And the neutrino mass have different orders of magnitude. Say, no, no, this yeah. is a fundamental question. Yeah, right? so you're right, but that, that's yeah. There's another question of because the other thing is that that's if you there are yeah you, you yeah exactly yeah, but uh, there is also other thing that you know there are all these uh, loop neutrino mass models that kind of predict the neutrino mass, and if you if you if you do what Michael says, you lose that kind of beauty, I guess. But uh, Z has a paper where he has like a two loop contribution to the dipole where he basically has like a vector on one side and a scalar on the other side with an effective vertex here. And in the vertex, you have another loop and he, he uh, embeds this in the, in the canonical Z model kind of thing. But uh, I don't think that, I mean, uh, yeah. These are, but uh, maybe I should also say the, that's, for, that's not for like a transition dipole, right? If you want to now do model building for a transition dipole, you have to talk about, well, what are the charges of this new field and your new, you know, UV theory? And yeah, that's even yeah, more that's, complicated. That's a whole lot of trouble. Uh, yeah, you really precisely. <laughs> I ignore that challenge. <laughs> yeah. Are there any other questions maybe for- Any uh, questions in the Zoom? I think not. Not let's well, thank um, Albert again and see you yeah, for yeah. the next talk. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>